Evidential evidentialism tries to argue for the existence of God by offering evidence of supernatural events. Picture this. A bunch of Christians believe the resurrection of Christ can be historically proven because there were loads of eyewitnesses who all died for their faith. And let's face it, people generally don't die for something they know isn't true, right? Then there are those who bring up evidence of super supernatural things like demonic possessions, where people start speaking languages they've never learned, or near-death experiences, where folks see things outside their bodies that they shouldn't be able to see. Imagine sitting in a courtroom, and instead of discussing mundane things like alibis, you're debating whether someone saw angels dancing on the head of a pin. It's like trying to prove that unicorns exist because your friend swears they saw one at the local park. So if you're curious about the wild and wacky world of evidentialism, get ready for a journey that's as entertaining as it is thought-provoking. Who knows? You might just find yourself pondering the mysteries of the universe and having a good laugh along the way. Moral. The moral argument goes like this. Objective morality is only real if God exists. Since we believe objective morality is real, then God must exist. Simple, right? But let's take a funny and curious twist. Imagine we're debating whether cannibalism is good or bad. One person says, cannibalism is good. Another shouts back, no, it's bad. They go back and forth like a bizarre tennis match. Who's right? Now, I'm assuming you agree that cannibalism is bad. If not, please stay away from me. But seriously, how do we know who's correct? How do we determine if these aren't just differing opinions? Our little friend here can only be objectively correct if there's a supreme authority that declares cannibalism is bad. And that supreme authority, that's what we call God. So if you're intrigued by the moral argument and enjoy a good laugh while pondering deep questions, dive into this philosophical debate, cosmological. The cosmological argument is like a philosophical game of dominoes. It starts with the idea that everything in the universe has a cause. Your alarm clock ringing, caused by the timer. The timer, set by you. But where does this chain of causes end? Can it go on forever? Not likely. At some point, there has to be a first cause, a domino that tips over everything else without itself being toppled. This unmoved mover, uncaused causer, unchanged changer has to be eternal. Why? Because if it ever started or stopped existing, it would be subject to change. And that's a no-no. It also needs to be outside the universe since everything in the universe is caused. And to be able to move everything without being moved itself, it has to be all-powerful. This mysterious first cause? We call it God. Still scratching your head? Let's make it even more mind-bending. Everything is a mix of actuality, what it is, and potentiality, what it could be. A baby is actually alive and has the potential to be an adult. An apple is actually red and has the potential to be eaten. When you munch on that apple, you're actualizing its potential to be eaten. Now, you also have potential. For example, you have the potential to be strong, even if you're not quite there yet. Anytime something changes you, it's actualizing some of your potential. But this chain of changes can't go back forever. Eventually, you hit an unactualized actualizer, something that doesn't need anything else to change it. And guess what? That's God. God is pure act, meaning he is everything he possibly could be. This makes him eternal because if he wasn't, he'd have the potential to not exist. But God has no potential. He just is. Being everything he could be also means he's all-powerful, as nothing can change him or affect him in any way. Originally proposed by Aristotle and later elaborated by Thomas Aquinas in Summa Contra Gentiles, this argument might be the philosophical equivalent of an advanced calculus problem but it's a fascinating journey into the nature of existence. So, if you're curious and ready for a brain workout, dive into the cosmological argument 
and explore the concept of the ultimate first cause, Pascal's Wager. Pascal's Wager is much simpler than other philosophical arguments and feels more like a thought experiment than a serious debate. Imagine you're an atheist. If atheism is correct, nothing happens after you die. No heaven, no hell, just eternal nothingness. In this case, you neither gain nor lose anything. It's a neutral outcome. But what if you're an atheist and it turns out you're wrong? What if God is real? Then you might be in for a very unpleasant surprise. Now, let's flip the coin. Say you believe in God and atheism is correct. You still end up with the same neutral outcome, no gain, no loss. However, if you believe in God and it turns out he's real, then you could gain everything, eternal happiness, heaven, the whole nine yards. So between these two possibilities, which one do you want to bet on? Believing in God offers a much better potential outcome. It's like choosing between a lottery ticket with a potential jackpot and one that guarantees no prize. Even if the odds are uncertain, wouldn't you want to bet on the chance of winning big? Pascal's wager invites you to think about belief as a gamble. It's a light-hearted yet intriguing way to consider faith, making you wonder which bet you'd prefer to place. So, if you're curious and enjoy a good mental bet, give Pascal's wager some thought. It might just be the best wager you ever make. Teleological The teleological argument suggests that everything in the universe seems to have a purpose, implying that the universe must have had a designer. Think about it. If you stumbled upon a complex machine, you'd naturally assume someone designed it, right? The teleological argument takes this idea and applies it to the entire universe. Imagine the universe as a giant, intricate machine. Things in nature, like the human cell or the ecosystem, are incredibly complex and work like clockwork. Darwinian evolution explains a lot of this complexity, but there are still some things it can't account for, like the four physical constants of the universe. These constants, the gravitational constant, the electron charge, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force, are so perfectly fine-tuned that if they were even a tiny bit different, the universe would collapse in on itself. It's like the universe is walking a tightrope, and these constants are the balancing pole, keeping everything steady. So, the teleological argument asks, if everything works so perfectly, doesn't that suggest a designer? It's like finding a beautifully crafted watch and knowing it didn't just assemble itself. This argument invites you to ponder the grand design of the cosmos, making you wonder if there's a cosmic watchmaker behind it all. If you're curious and enjoy a good dose of humor with your philosophical musings, the teleological argument offers a fascinating look at the universe. It keeps you hooked, making you think about the grand design while keeping things light and intriguing. So dive in and explore the idea that maybe, just maybe, the universe is one big, beautifully designed machine. Ontological. The ontological argument is like the ultimate philosophical bro moment. It says, God exists simply because of the way he is defined. No, seriously. God is defined as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. In other words, God must be all powerful, because being all powerful is greater than having limited power. He must be all knowing because knowing everything is greater than having limited knowledge. He must be all good, because being perfectly good is greater than having flaws. And crucially, God must exist, because existing is greater than not existing. You might think, wait, just because we can conceive of the greatest possible being doesn't mean it actually exists. But according to the ontological argument, it does. Why? because existing in reality is greater than just existing in the mind. You could try to use this logic to argue for the existence of the greatest possible pizza. However, that won't work. A pizza, by definition, has limitations. It's a specific size, it can be eaten, and it can be destroyed. 
If you had a pizza that was indestructible, eternal, all-powerful, and infinitely large, it wouldn't be a pizza anymore. It would be, well, God. So, the ontological argument playfully suggests that if anything becomes infinitely great, it turns into God. It's a humorous and curious way to think about existence and the nature of the divine. Personal Experience Let's talk about the personal experience argument for God's existence. It might sound a bit quirky, but everyone views the world through the lens of their own experiences. Many people are convinced God exists because of supernatural events they've witnessed, answered prayers, or even just uncanny coincidences in their lives. This argument works wonders for convincing oneself that God exists but isn't as effective at swaying others. Imagine trying to explain that your car started on a cold morning after you whispered a quick prayer. It's a divine intervention to you, but might just seem like luck to your skeptical friend. Personal experiences are like that favorite inside joke, hilarious and meaningful to you, but baffling to everyone else. So, while these experiences can profoundly affirm one's faith, they might not be the best tool for a universal debate. Transcendental The transcendental argument is like the ultimate philosophical mic drop. It claims that without God, nothing makes sense at all. We take a lot of things for granted, like the reliability of logic, the consistency of the natural world, and the existence of truth. But here's the kicker. We can't prove any of these things scientifically, they're the basic assumptions we need to even start doing science. Everything falls neatly into place if we assume a worldview where God exists. In this scenario, all these assumptions, logic, consistency, truth, are grounded in the mind of God. It's like having a divine warranty for the universe's operating system. But if God doesn't exist? Well, then we have no solid justification for our assumptions and everything just collapses like a house of cards. It's like trying to build a skyscraper on quicksand. Consciousness. The argument from consciousness is like a fascinating mind bender, suggesting that consciousness can't be explained by natural means alone. Atheists often say our brain is just a very advanced biological machine, but unlike our minds, machines can be reduced to their parts. Sure, our brain can be broken down into brain cells, but that's not the same as the experience of consciousness. Think about it. You might find a part of the brain responsible for seeing the color yellow, but that's not the same as experiencing yellowness. You can't study consciousness scientifically because you can only observe your own mind. For instance, there's no way to know if everyone sees colors the same way. Maybe my yellow looks like this, but to you, it looks completely different. Who knows, you could be the only person who truly exists, and everyone else might just be figments of your imagination. A single atom isn't conscious, two atoms aren't conscious, and a bunch of atoms aren't conscious either. So, even if you have a complex system of atoms, it's still just a complex arrangement of non-conscious parts. Where does consciousness come from then? This isn't exactly an argument for God but it does suggest the existence of the human soul, as it implies we need something immaterial to explain consciousness. Mathematics Let's talk about the mathematics argument, which suggests there's an infinite reality beyond our physical universe. At first glance, basic math seems pretty straightforward. For instance, the number five can represent five apples, and 5-3 can represent three groups of five apples. But as we dive into advanced math, things start to get a bit disconnected from our everyday world, yet they still work perfectly. Take real numbers, which correspond to real things. Then there are imaginary numbers, which are mathematically real, but don't correspond to anything tangible in our world. That's why they're called imaginary, but they still exist in the realm of mathematics. Consider the five most important numbers in mathematics. 1. The basis for all real numbers. 0. Essential for algebra. i. The basis for all imaginary numbers. 
E, crucial for exponential functions. P, pi, necessary for calculations involving circles. These numbers might seem unrelated, but they come together beautifully in Euler's identity, an equation discovered by Leonhard Euler, one of the greatest mathematicians in history. Euler saw this as proof that math was designed by God, and being a devout Calvinist, he believed this intricate beauty was no coincidence. Further evidence that math has a designer is found in the Mandelbrot set, which is generated by a simple equation in the complex plane but produces infinite detail and complexity.